Eastmead worshipping together. There are churches all across Luton, across England, across Europe, across the world, worshipping the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah? We are worshipping now because our faith, our church, our tradition is laid, has been laid down on those that went before us. Yeah? And in order to travel forward well as disciples of Jesus Christ into the future he's prepared for us, we need to remember and honour and understand as deeply as we can where we've come from. Yeah? So come back with me in your imaginations 2,000 years to when Jesus was on earth. Yeah? 2,000 years of faithful people who kept the faith alive Jesus, remember we looked at two weeks ago, uh, shared the Last Supper with his friends, yeah? Told them to do this in remembrance of him, breaking the bread and the, drinking the wine, in remembrance of his death on the cross, until he comes again in glory, yeah? And do you remember how two weeks ago we looked at where that came from, what Jesus was doing on, on that occasion? He was remembering... God's mighty act of deliverance of his people from slavery in Egypt, yeah, uh, in the year about sort of 1250 BC. We're going to travel back a bit further. Jesus enacting the Passover supper, the last supper with his friends, was reenacting what had happened uh, when Moses delivered the people of God by a mighty hand of God out of slavery into the promised land, yeah. But today we're going to go back, even farther back in history than that. Right back, 4,000 years ago, I kind of, uh, at the moment, I'm almost sitting on Jimmy's lap there if I go a bit too far, but over here, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years before Jesus walked the earth, Abraham. A man who knew nothing of the God that we worship at all. A pagan. He had his own gods, as people would have done. But there he was, one day, he heard a voice. The voice of Yahweh, the voice of Jehovah, the voice of the living God who spoke to him and said <coughs> this. Chapter 12, Genesis. The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Wow. That's quite a mandate, isn't it? Here we are today, together worshipping God, because this man, Abraham, 4,000 years ago, heard the voice of the Lord, heard what he was saying to him, leave your country and go to another place, and obeyed, went, and through him, through Abraham's offspring, Generation after generation after generation of worshippers of the living God, Yahweh, formed. That's why we're here. We're children of Abraham. So it's important for us to understand God's call on this man, how he heard his voice, how he responded in obedience, and how God played that relationship with him out. So you'll remember the story. Of course, if you're going to be uh, a father of all nations, and all nations on earth are going to be blessed through your offspring, what have you got to become? A dad. You've got to become a father, right? So Abraham went through his life, found his wife, Sarah, got married, waited. No children, no son. For years and years and years, he must have thought, did I hear God aright? Back then, 
me when I was in Harem to leave and up stumps and leave my people and leave my place and my culture and my old gods and go on this journey round the fertile crescent into this new place? Did I hear God right that day when he said he was going to bless all nations through my offspring? Because there's no sign of any son around here. <coughs> Eventually, in their old age, they're told by God, you are going to have a son. You are going to, and they laugh. They just laugh. They thought, it's so ridiculous. We're way past the age of having children. Get, a, get real God. But he went on believing, and he went on trusting that God would fulfill what he promised he would do. Against all the evidence, he kept on believing. Isaac is born. Might be plain sailing from there, but it isn't plain sailing. Because this God who's spoken to him, the God that we're worshipping this morning, puts our faith to the test to refine it from one degree of refinement to another, to another, to another, to test whether we will really trust him, even when all the evidence says, suggests that there's no reason to trust at all or hope. So turn now on, please, to chapter 22 in Genesis. Now the rubber really hits the road. Fasten your safety belts. <clears throat> Some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Some of you, good contemporary citizens of the UK living in 2014, will think this is child abuse. <coughs> if somebody came to me and said, Vicar, um, God has told me to take my son and sacrifice him, I would have to say, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to report this to the police immediately. Wouldn't I? If I didn't, I'd be committing a crime. These are this is 4,000 years ago. This is another culture. Let's remember that. And in those days, so we are told, actually the pagan uh, so, uh, the sacrifice of children in pagan religions was not uncommon. We need to just remember that. But we should at the same time receive the shock of this in its full magnitude. Here is God calling on Abraham to sacrifice his son. I was um, invited round to the house of some members of Christ Church the other day to talk about the life of Christ Church. And they said, um, after some time of discussion, <coughs> they said, our worship is really weird. It's really weird. Now, I went away and thought about this, and it, I, I thought, well, it could be because I've become rather weird and eccentric, and I would accept that totally. Margaret often says, you're strange, you're weird. I said, yes, I am, that's fine. And smarten yourself up and uh, become less weird, and so I try to do that. <laughs> but as, it, as I thought about this more fully, after this meeting, I thought, well, actually, our message is rather weird in the face of contemporary secular humanist culture. It is shocking. When Paul writes to the Corinthian church, he says that God is foolish. But the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And he writes, I decided to preach nothing else except Christ crucified. Paul, full of philosophical wisdom of the Greeks and the Romans, he knew loads of stuff he could keep people 
entertained for all day long. But he says, I decided to preach God crucified. Foolishness to the Gentiles, a scandal to the Jews, folly, a crazy weird message, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our message, at some level or other, is weird. It's difficult for people to hear it. Always has been, always will be, but if we water it down and adapt it to make it nice and palatable for the person to come in off out of the streets of Bushmead, water it down to make it all nice and acceptable and palatable, we miss, we might risk diluting it and giving another message in the gospel. Here is a God. Here, who is calling on his chosen servant, Abraham, through whom he has promised he will bless all nations on earth to kill dead any chance of this man's uh, offspring uh, being a blessing to any other people at all because he's calling him to sacrifice his own son. How weird is that? Genesis chapter 2, moving on. Verse 3. Let's see how Abraham responds to this call from God to go and sacrifice his son. Verse 3. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back. We will come back. His faith that they, Abraham and his son Isaac, will come back. He, Abraham, verse 6, took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he carried himself the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Abraham has faith that somehow, out of this absurd situation that seems impossible to understand at any level at all, somehow God will honour what he's, what he's called on him to do. God will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. I find it interesting that the text doesn't get into all the incredible anxiety that Abraham must have been experiencing and all the confusion Isaac must have been experiencing as they walked up the mountain. It just states it as it is. And it allows the reader to imagine it. And the text pulls out what's really, really important for us to get, as we shall see. Verse 9. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. God has taken him right to the brink. He's tested his faith to the uttermost to see whether this man is willing to carry out God's will, his command. But what happens? Verse 11. 
But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Verse 13. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Just to make sure Abraham has really understood at the deepest level what this has been about, the angel of the Lord speaks. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Because you have obeyed me. 4,000 years ago, one man Abraham hears, is tested more than I can imagine any person has ever been tested. He's tested by God to see whether his faith will endure whatever God asks of him. He obeys. He's willing to obey. The test has happened. And because of his, uh, his response to the test, because he was willing to go the whole way with his God, even to the point of sacrificing his own son, folly that may, may have seen in every possible way, because he obeys, every generation is blessed. A few sand, grains of sand on the seashore, his family, his extended family, a few more grains of sand in, on, on the seashore few more stars in the sky. And so he goes on and grows and grows and grows and grows like this. Jesus comes onto earth. Moses as well or did his bit, didn't he? Jesus comes to earth and the, the same narrative is picked up. The narrative of, of hearing the word of the Lord, the willingness to obey, whatever the evidence might be or however silly the call may seem, the willingness to obey, and then because of that obedience, they're becoming more and more sand, grains of sand on the seashore, more and more people hearing the good news, hearing the message, and it grows and grows and grows and grows until the end in Scripture says, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. It's like a virus, a virus of obedience. Last night, um, this the evening, I was in a home, uh, a Roma family home. I, I don't think I've ever experienced such joy in a group of, of, of people in this extended family home. Uh, a home where the whole idea of faith and obeying God has been seriously held in the balance because it would mean serious turning away from any kind of lying or stealing or anything like that or unhelpful things like smoking and drinking it would be such a cost so it's been held really at bay like this but God spirit had come to rest in one young well, not so young actually he's got four children but one woman and she was on fire for God, absolutely on fire for God. She's going to be baptised in our church here in a few weeks' time. 
And because of that joy in her heart, one of Cornelia's relatives, because of one of her joy, this woman's heart, in spite of the horrendous things she's been through, that joy was spreading through all the others in her family, her wider extended family as they came along. And they were just crying. They were just weeping. She's been touched. God, God appears to be real. We're being touched too. We're picking it up. She is obeying, hearing and obeying God, who is alive and kicking, and is touching us. We're being infected by this. And so it goes on. And the virus spreads. The good news spreads. But the journey is difficult. A lamb, a ram, is provided, caught in the thicket in the story of Genesis 22. Yeah? God rescues the situation at the 11th hour, yeah, the 59th minute. He rescues it by providing Abraham a ram to sacrifice. The son Isaac is spared. That's 4,000 years ago. That cashes out 2,000 years ago when God the Father, the same one that spoke to Isaac, sends his son, his only son, his begot unbegotten son, his beloved only son, Jesus Christ, into the world in order that this son would be sacrificed for us all. God provides the lamb, as he said, as Abraham said to Isaac, God provides the lamb in ultimately providing his own son, Jesus. Jesus, who in the Garden of Gethsemane is tested to the uttermost to see whether his faith will endure. Jesus prays, let this cup pass from me, this, but not my will, your will be done. Jesus knows he could just slip out of the garden of his chemi, avoid arrest, avoid trial, avoid torture, avoid crucifixion. His faith is tested and he says, no, not your way, not my way, not my will be done, but your will be done, Father God. Angels come, one of the Gospels tell us, to help him. Do you see, Jesus' response there in the Garden of Gethsemane is the same as his father, his Abraham, who was tested and obeyed. Jesus is tested and obeys, even to death on a cross. So, Lent, we give up chocolate, we give up cake, we give up television, we give up all sorts of things that are good to give up for a season, because it's a good thing to do. But just for a moment, think of a thing, whatever it may be, it may be a person, it may be a career, it may be a project, it may be a holiday, it could be anything. But think of that thing that is closest to your heart <coughs> right now. Jesus said, there where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And I put it to you, and I put it to myself first of all, I must put this to myself again and again, I put it to you that that might just be an obstacle, this thing that you treasure so much, it may be a very good, it may even be a very holy thing if you like, um, that this thing could just be an obstacle between you and the God, your God. It could just be an idol. And so you see with Abraham, it could just have been that his beloved son, who he'd waited so long to be blessed with, 
uh, was in some way an obstacle between him and God. And that unless he was willing to give up that son, to, to, to release him, he would not break through to the heart of God. And so ask yourself, how it would feel, how it would be if God said to you, I want you to give this thing up. And <clears throat> how, imagine how it would be if the very giving up of that thing would seem like folly itself, stupidity, right? Just as Abraham must have felt when being called on to have to sacrifice his son, it must have thought, God, you have lost it. I can imagine that Abraham might have even thought, if we put it in contemporary language, uh, maybe I'm a kind of um, paranoid schizophrenic and I'm just losing my marbles in this voice. <laughs> you see the extent to which God is testing Abraham, Jesus, you, me. Writer to the Hebrews. Now faith, chapter 11, verse 1, is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Sometimes that's put like this. Faith is believing against all the evidence and then waiting for the evidence to change. You turn over from in Hebrews chapter 11, you'll see that he, he, having gone, he works his way through all the heroes of faith, this writer, all through the centuries, all 4,000 years of them. No, not quite, but 2,000. We are the, the next ones. But if you look now at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, <coughs> Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, I'll give you a moment to find that. It's about page 1144. In the Pew Bible. Is it? One two one one. One two zero nine. One. One two zero nine. One two zero nine in the Pew Bible. One two zero nine. Here we go. Verse eight of Hebrews chapter eleven. By faith. Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later uh, receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs for him, with him, of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so, this one man, and he, and he as good as, as dead, came, sorry, and so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars of the seashore, sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Believing against the evidence, waiting for the evidence to change. And so, take this one thing that is so dear and so precious to you and ask yourself the question, if God were to call on you to give it up, would you be willing to do that? He might, you might then lose that one thing, or like Abraham, you might uh, lose it, you might get it back, <laughs> the 11th hour, as he got his son Isaac back. Think of Jesus. Jesus was willing to lay down his own life. He lost his life, but got it back in the resurrection. So, would you be willing to give this up if called on to God to do this? In faith that whatever you get back will be the best, very best possible thing for you and for everyone with you. I 
think this is the ultimate test of faith. My, my dad um, said to me when I was a theology student that he could not believe in God, the God of the Bible, anymore because he could not believe in a God who would, called on, who would, call, would be called or would decide to sacrifice his own son, Jesus. My father said this out of having lost his own oldest beloved son, my brother Stephen. I cannot understand how God would want to sacrifice his own son, he said to me. And I said to him, Dad, um, maybe that was the only way he could show the world his love, by willing to give up the thing most precious to him. And I think it made a bit of sense to my dad when I said that. But it's only in giving something up that we receive something back. And that it's one thing to give up cake for Lent, fine, you'll lose a few inches or centimetres <laughs> on your waistline. But it is another thing to give up the thing that is most dear and most precious to you in faith that if that is a call from God, he will honour it. And there will ultimately be seen to be a purpose for him having chosen called him to do that. Jesus says, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world if he loses his own life? Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Jesus, uh, Paul goes on in the epistles to talk about, I have been crucified with Christ. Not I live, but he lives in me. Death to self. Death to your own ego. Death to your own best hopes and plans. This is very difficult. In the eyes of the secular humanist world around us, this is not just weird, this is really, really, really crazy stuff. Is it? I think it is. It's a very difficult, bitter pill to swallow. But it's the pill, if we're going to be true to the gospel, it's the pill that gives life. Because in relinquishing everything, in letting go of everything, and we, in the end, will have to do that when we die, in letting go of everything, we receive freedom and life and joy, and it becomes very contagious and infectious, yeah? And it spreads, and the, the, the descendants of Abraham, who are we, become more numerous than the stars of the sky and the grains of sand on the seashore. It spreads like it was spreading through that home last night. This woman who's lost, been kicked out of her home by her husband because he thought she had hepatitis B and he won't have her in the house anymore. She's lost all her four children, but she's full of joy. Exploding with joy. And it's contagious and it's catching. And it's the good 